good evening friends today we have the beginning of 45th annual conference of mumbai hematology group this is day 1 this event is managed by mice ideas and grateful to them for all the hard work they have put in in last few months today we have a 2 hour sponsored program which is supported by msd suburban diagnostics astrazeneca and lilac insights in that order our first lecture of the day is by dr parikshit prayag and this lecture is on management of invasive fungal infections in febrile neutropenia patients a case based discussion dr parikshit prayag is consultant transplant infectious diseases at dinanath mangeshkar hospital pune india is american board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases done a fellowship in transplant infectious diseases from stanford university usa i'll stop sharing my screen now and request dr parikshit to give his talk please unmute yourself sir sorry yeah sorry about that so good evening everyone and thank you so much uh, agarwal sir you know for calling me and for the kind introduction it's my absolute privilege to be associated with this group um if my slides are visible let me know so that i can start yes yes thank you sir thank you so once again good evening everyone so in the next 30 minutes or so you know i'll be talking about fungal infections in in neutropenic hosts and uh, via cases so it's it's an extensive topic to cover uh, you know something which has so many intricacies and and so many you know minor details that we need to be aware of so what i thought is that i will focus on two cases you know through which i can uh, sort of bring out some take home messages because it's it's an extensive topic to cover so instead of trying to cover everything i'll just cover two illustrative cases and try to focus on you know some of the things that we sort of overlook in in daily practice so i will not be talking about you know mundane things like getting a ct scan or you know the utility of a galactomannan or a bdg or you know what is the drug of choice let's say for an aspergillus i'll be not talking about such mundane things i'll be trying to focus on a few different aspects about managing fungal infections in neutropenic hosts and something that is emerging and something that we tend to overlook sometimes in our daily clinical practice so let me start off with my first case so this is a 42 year old gentleman who had a fleet 3 positive aml and then he underwent 7 plus 3 induction chemotherapy towards the end of his induction chemotherapy he started developing the diarrhea which was you know initially non bloody so it was initially watery greenish uh, in color and he also developed some nausea and vomiting and low grade fevers so by then you know his by the time his uh, fleet 3 positive aml was diagnosed he had had neutropenia for about 3 weeks and of course you know as we all know with with our aml patients qualitative neutropenia is is a significant factor to be considered so at that point of time you know this gentleman underwent a stool biofire test which showed a cdf pcr to be positive and both toxin a and toxin b were positive so this was a toxigenic strain of clostridium difficile and he also had a cdf assay which was done and that showed a gdh antigen positive and toxin a and b detected so there was nothing which was uh, you know dubious about this so this was definitely a case of clostridium difficile associated diarrhea a little odd for an aml patient to be presenting with cdf but of course uh, i will not go into the details of that there is a concern about community acquired cdf also by the time a lot of these aml patients are diagnosed in the preceding 2 or 3 weeks they do get antibiotics because sometimes they present you know because of an infectious problem and then sort of get diagnosed with cytopenias and and then the work up of aml follows so uh, it although unusual not not unheard of or not extraordinarily uncommon for an aml patient in his induction chemo to have clostridium difficile associated diarrhea so he was started on oral vancomycin and then 3 days later the diarrhea improved so after 4 days on oral vancomycin now there is recurrence of fever and there is recurrence of diarrhea but what is interesting is that this time the diarrhea now changes its character so what was greenish watery loose bowel movements before now becomes bloody and the intensity of fever also increases so initially you know he had a low grade fever which is often the case in clostridium difficile infections and he had non bloody diarrhea which is also often the case usually it is rare to have 
bloody diarrhea with C diff infections. So at this point of time, an ID consult was called, and initially we thought that you know he is having a um, uh, vancomycin refractory C diff. So something that we have unfortunately seen quite a bit of in our center, and there are concerns about especially the NAB B twenty seven strain in India, which can be a little refractory to vancomycin. So he was changed to. Oral ticoplanin. Again, I will not go into the details of his C diff. That's that's a topic for another day. So, he, so to summarize, you know, he had diarrhea after induction chemotherapy. Initially, gets diagnosed with C diff. Gets started on oral vancomycin. The diarrhea initially improves, and then after three to four days, it worsens again. And this time, interestingly, changes its character. So it becomes bloody, and the intensity of fever also increases. At this is the point where an infectious disease. Uh, references placed, and then the vancomycin is changed to oral ticoplanin, and we recommend an endoscopy for him because you know we need to look beyond Clostridium difficile because of two reasons. You know he had high grade fevers and he had bloody diarrhea, both of which are a little unusual for a pure Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Now this gentleman has been has just undergone his induction chemotherapy for AML. So as is often the protocol, you know he is placed on um, posaconazole prophylaxis. And when we get his posaconazole levels, his levels are 0.3 or 373 nanograms. So that is on the lower side, uh, and you would be unhappy if you see these levels. Um, in the prophylactic setting, you know you would want levels of at least 0.7 or 700 nanograms. And in the therapeutic setting for aspergillus, you would want levels of at least 1.2 to 1.5. For mucor, you know, depending on the species, you would even want higher levels. At this point of time, you know his serum galactamine and beta D glucan is negative. His stool ONP is negative. His uh, stool biofire panel is repeated. Again, it doesn't show anything beyond the clostridium infection, which he is already harboring. And then in the upper GI endoscopy, he shows all these necrotic-looking masses. So if you see the gastric body and if you see the uh, you know the duodenal bulb, he shows these necrotic-looking masses. So when you look at these, you would be extremely concerned about it. Fungal infection, and as can be the case, you know, AML patients can present with invasive fungal infections. Now, his biopsy findings were uh, showing mucor mycosis, so he had GI mucor mycosis, so he had broad aseptic hyphae, which were suggestive of mucor mycosis. So, what I'll focus on is, you know, his species. So, his cultures actually grew a species known as mucor circinelloides. Now, let me try and focus on why this is important. So, if you look at Zygomyces, then Zygomyces is an order. So when we think of mucor mycosis, you know we often tend to think of one etiological agent, and and that is where you know the uh, the devil lies in the details, as to say. So if when you when you think of the order mucor mycosis, you have to think of different species. Now the commonest species or the commonest agent or the commonest genus causing mucor mycosis is actually Rhizopus world over as well as in India, but you can have Other genera or other species causing mucor mycosis. So, for example, rhizomucor or apsidia or Cunninghamella or Saxenia. These are all agents which can be associated with mucor mycosis. So, very important to know this because our management really changes according to the kind of species or the kind of genus that we see in these patients. Now, here is a beautiful illustration of that. So, if you look at this table, we'll quickly realize that not All mucor mycosis cases are treated in the same way. Now, if you look at this table, overwhelmingly the drug of choice is amphotericin. So, liposomal amphotericin, except you know in cases of renal mucor mycosis, wherein the penetration of liposomal amphotericin is limited, so that would be your conventional amphotericin, deoxycholate. Except renal mucor mycosis or except genitourinary mucor mycosis, uniformly the drug of choice would be uh, liposomal amphotericin. but look at the different species or the different genera and look at the resistance rates or the susceptibility uh, percentages as has been given in this study here according to the different species so if you look at rhizopus and as i mentioned you know our most common species is rhizopus so immediately the question would be that how do we even get to the species so if there is growth then an experienced microbiologist will be able to tell you which species this is but if there is no growth then one way of doing this is you know to sequence out so to send a 16s IT, 18s and its sequencing and once you get to the species and the genus level the sequencing will be able to give you the answer to this question as i mentioned if there is growth then your microbiologist either with his own um, observations or by doing a maldit of will be able to tell you which genus this is 
So if you look at the different genera, then you will see that mucor within the uh, order mucoralis actually has the poorest response rates to posaconazole. Now this would be very important because this is since he, this patient is growing mucor circinelloides. Look at the susceptibility susceptibility rates: hundred percent for amphotericin versus zero percent for posaconazole. So usually step down therapy using an azole is very very unlikely to work in cases of mucor circinelloides. So let us consider posaconazole versus isoconazole. Now there was a Lancet study in which you know uh, there were some centers even from India who participated, and that showed that there was non-inferiority of isoconazole as against amphotericin. So that's why currently in the guidelines, if a patient does have compromised kidneys, then isoconazole is an option, and isoconazole is a decent option even to. uh step down to an oral uh, agent for these kind of patients but again as i said the devil lies in the details so if you compare the mics of the different species then you will quickly see that for rhizopus isoconazole is actually better but for mucor so the, the species mucor circinelloides which was found in this particular patient rhizop uh, isoconazole and posaconazole both are poor options so again i think this would be an important slide so here i have summarized the evidence of you know the different species uh, oral agents and how they would work against the different species or the genera so as i mentioned rhizopus which is our most uh, species in mucor mycosis or even world over it's the most common species isoconazole is more likely to act than posa because isoconazole usually has better mics for rhizopus as against posaconazole if you are dealing with rhizomucor or if you are dealing with lishthymia these are a little forgiving because why do i say that because both are likely to act well but if you are dealing with something like mucor circinelloides or or any of the subspecies mucor then both are likely to be poor options so again why do we so stress so much on these tongue twisters the take home message from from this uh, slide is that you know it's important to know the agent of mucor mycosis we often look at mucor mycosis as one clinical syndrome there is a single clinical syndrome but we often tend to think of it as you know having one particular etiological agent so very important to remember that it is an order it is not a particular species mucor mycosis it's an order in the fungal kingdom and that's why there were there are many different agents that can cause mucor mycosis now if i had to really enumerate the differences between isoconazole and posaconazole Isoconazole does have evidence of non-inferiority. As I mentioned, there is a Lancet study which showed that isoconazole can be non-inferior to amfo. However, we are not there yet, wherein we can call isa the drug of choice for um, uh, mucor mycosis. Of course, to, towards the end of the week, we'll have more on isoconazole because we do have a panel discussion on isoconazole and its place in the hematology world in this conference. So, so I won't go into the details of that. the mics of isoconazole for certain species are lower so for example for rhizopus it's a better choice than posa its cns penetration is better it's a lighter molecule so its cns penetration is comparable to voriconazole and its cns penetration is better than posa its pharmacodynamic properties are more favorable so usually you will have better aoc to mic ratios and it has more predictable pharmacokinetics so more predictable levels and safety profile is also better so there is no hepatotoxicity there is no qt prolongation and so on whereas posa if you see the cost is significantly lower and because of the fact that it's a heavier molecule it has more volume of distribution and what does volume of distribution correlate to it correlates to the tissue penetration or tissue distribution so tissue distribution might be slightly better so again when we are picking the agent so initially when we are giving these patients amphotericin when we are trying to step down to a particular agent you know we have to really think of the different species what is the site where i want my azole to act and so on so this patient was started on high dose liposomal amphotericin because you know absolutely azoles are not going to be useful um, and again initially the drug of choice is going to be liposomal amphotericin but as a, you know often that we find with gi mucor mycosis the risk of secondary infections is enormous because of the fact that these patients develop necrotic bowels so it's a surgery although important is not feasible always in these type of patients so unfortunately he developed uh, septic shock and uh, later on his blood cultures grew and drug resistant klebsiella and then his shock worsened and he ultimately succumbed so what would be the take home messages from my first case always try to get the species up front and really your the, the best window of opportunity 
to get your species and to get all this knowledge is up front in a worsening patient when you are trying to play a catch up game these things become difficult so my opportunity to get maximum information is up front so what is the species what are the mics so these are the kind of things that i need to ask my microbiologist because management strategies for different species are different gi mucormycosis is rare but it's 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 a difficult to manage condition why it's difficult to diagnose in the first place a lot of we have seen about three or four cases even in the post covid pandemic wherein you know patients complained of vague nausea and vomiting and initially we tend to you know attribute it to a drug or we tend to you know work up in terms of pancreatitis or or you know some other causes but gi mucormycosis is not something that we easily think of and unless we scope them we we are not uh, able to diagnose these conditions the stomach is the commonest site followed by the colon and uh, the ileum so it is usually a, a small intestinal condition and an upper gi condition the some symptoms are varied they are non specific um and combined medical and surgical therapy is absolutely essential so you know these these are some of the interesting aspects so again take home messages try to get the species try to get maximum information up front and you know in a patient in whom you suspect a mold infection never shy away from doing an endoscopy because gi mucormycosis may be missed in these patients again the site is important so as i mentioned you know the species and the site these are there are various things that i need to consider when i am trying to choose therapy for these type of patients with this i have about 10 minutes so let me quickly go over to my second case so this is again a 24 year old male with aml he undergoes induction chemotherapy and then develops neutropenic fever so he started on piperacillin tazobactam for neutropenic fever his fever continues on day 5 his procalcitonin is negative two sets of blood cultures which have been sent are negative so as uh, you know the protocol would suggest on day 4 or day 5 if these patients do continue to have neutropenic fevers a ct chest is is a very valuable diagnostic tool so he undergoes a ct of the chest an hr ct of the chest and there you have a, a, a consolidation which has which does not show an air bronchogram and which has perinodular or or you know peripheral ground glassing so this is a very classic picture for a mold pneumonia now again when i think of mold pneumonias my commonest agent of mold pneumonias is going to be aspergillus but that is not going to be the end of the story you can have mucor you can have fusarium you can have cedosporium so these are the kind of different species that we need to think about even within aspergillus you know the treatment for one particular species is uh, maybe different from other species so for example there might be species who have higher mics for voriconazole so again the uh, important aspect of managing these patients is to get as many microbiological details so this patient was on posaconazole prophylaxis because this is an aml patient undergoing induction chemotherapy levels were sent these were undetectable now even with the delayed release tablet of posaconazole you know we are just finishing up uh, writing our experience on posaconazole levels almost 20% of our patients even on the delayed release tablet have been found to have sub therapeutic posa levels and especially patients who have diarrhea gvhd or are being fed through the rt tube or you know patients who have um, obesity or who are on ppis these are the patients who are at risk of having undetectable levels so very important to get your levels when you are using azoles now his serum galactomannan was 0.3 now usually this is a neutropenic patient who is on mold active prophylaxis but his prophylaxis uh, his mold uh, sorry his antifungal levels are undetectable so effectively he is not on prophylaxis so again a neutropenic patient who is not on prophylaxis your serum galactomannan should have fairly high sensitivity around 80 to 90% now that's negative does it rule out aspergillosis not completely and this is where i want to touch base on the aspergillus pcr whole blood now there are a lot of different whole blood pcrs coming up in the field of mycology you know let us step back and remind ourselves that whole blood candida pcr is not something which is yet validated but this case with aspergillus pcr from the whole blood is different there is a lot of good so is aspergillus pcr which was sent in the whole blood was positive so what does that mean you know aspergillus pcr is a very important tool of diagnosing aspergillosis in patients who have a hematological malignancy who are neutropenic and who are not on mold active prophylaxis and why is that because the sensitivity of the test is the highest in this sort of a setting 
So that's why in this setting, you know, if I have a combination of galactomannan and PCR, which is negative, then my negative predictive value is very, very high. So when I, even in the neutropenic patient, you know, who is having um, a hematological malignancy and who is not on mold active prophylaxis, as was the case here, because the levels were undetectable. When I see this type of a picture uh, on the CT scan, a good combination would be to send um, galactomannan and aspergillus PCR and even beta D glucan if you have access to that. Why? Because you know, if these things are negative, then their negative predictive value, especially when you combine them, when you combine a galactomannan and when you combine an aspergillus PCR, their combined negative predictive value is very, very good. So that's me. That means that if, if both these are negative, I will have reasonable confidence to say that this is a mold pneumonia. Why? Because the CT scan shows a mold appearance, but this is a non aspergillus mold pneumonia. So this is the time, you know, I will think of mucor. I might think of fusarium. I might think of pseudosporium and, and so on. So, the, or, or pigmented molds, penicillium, you know, pheohyphomycosis. These are the kind of things that I would think of. So now another benefit of this whole blood PCR is that it has a higher potential to diagnose invasive aspergillosis earlier. So if you look at studies, then the median time to positivity is slightly lower for a blood PCR, which means that once patients start brewing an aspergillus infection, the blood PCR can turn positive a little bit earlier than the galactomannan. Now, there are certain uh, species that can be detected, but you know they, they will not give you all the species. And of course, there are also certain mutations which can come as a part of the PCR kit. So for example, CYP51A, which is a mutation which is associated with voriconazole resistance. So again, these are additional benefits of getting a PCR upfront. Now, PCR positivity may be indicative of aspergillus exposure prior to other biomarkers becoming detectable. Now, the caution lies in interpreting a BAL PCR because a BAL aspergillus PCR positive may indicate colonization and may not always indicate invasive pulmonary aspergillus. So these are, this is just a, a summary of the evidence of, you know, the PCR studies, which have been done so far. I've just put the most important ones, but what I want you to focus on is the negative predictive value. So again, patients who have hematological malignancies, these are studies done only in hematological malignancies and patients who are not on mold active prophylaxis. So antifungals at the time of PCR, that whole entire column is 0% for all these four studies. So that's why I only included these four studies. Look at the negative predictive values, you know, 90, 90 in the 90s, 97%, 98%, 94%. So again, the take home message is neutropenic patients, hematological malignancies, not on mold active prophylaxis, a whole blood PCR, especially in combination with a negative galactomannan has excellent negative predictive value. Now he was started on voriconazole because his POSA levels are undetectable. Drug of choice of aspergillus, although there is now data to suggest that POSA is non-inferior, drug of choice is voriconazole. So he started on voriconazole. Now, four days later, the serum galactomannan is repeated and it's 3.1. So see how beautifully this case is actually following literature. Four days later, his serum galactomannan now becomes positive. But still, we decide to go for a CT-guided lung biopsy. Now, why do we need to do that? Again, no, not all patients will need this. But patients in whom you know you are a little uh, suspecting of you know a, a dual mold picture, or patients in whom you know you need good uh, information about the resistance patterns up front, really it, it would be time to still pursue the species. So, for example, if this aspergillus turns out to be something like uh, you know Calidostus or aspergillus niger or aspergillus lentulus, again my voriconazole also has a potential to fail. Now, if you look at bronchoscopies versus CT guided lung biopsies, then the diagnostic yield for mold pneumonias and the potential to change management is higher in CT guided lung biopsies. Of course, you have to balance it out with, with the risks because you know there is a risk of pneumothorax, bleeding. These are neutropenic patients. These are often highly thrombocytopenic as well. But just to keep in mind, you know, that, that uh, it's important to chase a microbiological diagnosis because markers or PCRs again, will not tell you resistance patterns or species all the time. Now we did a CT guided lung biopsy and his calcofluor stain showed broad aseptic hyphae, which were indicative of mucormycosis. So this is a dual mold picture, something that you, you know, see in five to 10% of the cases. So that's why his therapy was changed to amphotericin plus isoconazole because there are, there are concerns about voriconazole actually worsening the picture of mucormycosis because it can 
upregulate the GRP78 receptors to which the mucor can bind. So there is some potential concern about voriconazole worsening a picture of mucor mycosis. So it was changed to amphotericin plus isovoconazole because isovoconazole is there is definitely robust data about the non inferiority uh, with voriconazole for aspergillosis. So usually you know species uh, that are covered by voriconazole are also well covered by isovoconazole. Usually their MICs overlap pretty well. And then amphotericin is here for the uh, mucor. Now five days later, his isovoconazole levels. So recently in the last two months, we have we have started doing isovoconazole levels. And interestingly, we are finding that you know not everyone has good therapeutic levels. Of course, I have only three patients in the 40 patients in whom I have done levels so far because it's not a test done in India. So we had to get it validated with European labs. But in the 40 odd patients in whom we have done levels so far, we have found three patients who have been subtherapeutic. Again, we need to have more data to see what the factors associated are. But again, this tells you that uh, whenever we are using, um, you know, azoles, levels should always be done. Again, the, the merit for doing isovuconazole levels is not as strong as it is for posaconazole or voriconazole levels because usually isovuconazole has very predictable pharmacokinetics. So usually it is very, very rare to find a patient who has subtherapeutic levels, except, you know, some patients who might have CYP3A4 polymorphisms because that is the enzyme which metabolizes isovuconazole. So he was put on dual therapy and repeat CT chest three weeks later showed significant resolution. At that point of time, we were happy that, you know, amphotericin has done its job. He has clinically and radiographically improved. Isovuconazole is a broad spectrum azole. It has good activity against mucor, good activity against aspergillus. We have increased the dose. Now his levels are good. He's tolerating it well, except his wallet, you know, his body is tolerating the isovuconazole well. So we continued isovuconazole and this patient continues to do well. So last one minute and last one slide, it's almost 6.57. So take home messages for patients with hematological malignancies and not on mold active prophylaxis. Aspergillus PCR is an emerging diagnostic modality. It may precede marker positivity and together with galactomannan, if it is negative, if both are negative, they may have a combined high negative predictive value. Lung biopsy or you know bronchoscopy should always be kept in mind not at the cost of safety, but should always be kept in mind because they can give you further information about the species and about the MICs if you have access to um, antifungal susceptibility testing and they may change management. There are actually studies which show that a biopsy changes management more than a bronchoscopy. Dual molds may always be lurking in the picture in these patients. So always be mindful of this, especially if your patient is not improving. And drug levels are always very important to consider. Not so much for isovoconazole, but definitely for osaconazole and voriconazole. So once again, thank you so much for having me. This was a, a whirlwind, whirlwind presentation because of the constraints of time. But I hope you enjoyed it. And, you know, I would be happy to take a few questions if time permits us. Thank you so much, Dr. Sadikshit. Two beautiful cases, beautifully worked up and discussed extremely well. You were crystal clear in your message. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes. So if uh, Ritu or Shruti or Dr. Das Gupta, you have any question for Dr. Parikshit? Uh, sir, actually I have uh, I've sent in the chat. Parikshit, it was a very nice presentation. Uh, Thank you. Ma'am. See, I just had like this uh, good that aspergillus PCR. This is a new thing I've learned today. So only question was, suppose on the CT scan on your second case, uh, it was like showing, uh, it was more like clinically and radiologically pointing out towards a fungal infection or aspergillus. So mm -hmm. will a uh, blood PCR help us in what way in, in management or identifying the species? Like I didn't understand the correlation if we have on the CT scan, how much uh, beneficial this aspergillus PCR in the blood group? Yes, absolutely. So that, that's, that's a very important point to address and thank you for asking that. So the whole point of an aspergillus piece, so when you see a mold pneumonia on a CT scan, you know, aspergillus is one of the differentials. Although if you look at epidemiological studies, then 80 to 90% of these pneumonias will be aspergillus, but there could be, you know, 10 to 20% other molds which are involved. So mucor or fusarium, pseudosporium, uh, pigmented molds and so on. So if you look at an aspergillus PCR, then, then if you combine it, so when I see this type of a picture and I send both aspergillus blood PCR and a galactomannan, and this is a hematological malignancy patient who is not on antifungal prophylaxis. And if both are negative, 
then the negative predictive value is excellent, which means that if I, in this patient, if I send a galactomannan and an aspergillus PCR and both are negative, and that's the reason I have, you know, started doing this in-house. If both are negative, then I should be very seriously considering non-aspergillus molds. And, and that, that is the utility of, 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 you know, this, this sort of a combined testing. Because if you send only one of this, then the negative predictive value may not be high enough for you to say, we, we often see this, when we see this type of a picture, we send a galactomannan, you know, the galactomannan is very borderline positive or it's negative or it's weak positive. Then you're unsure of whether this, you know, patient really has aspergillosis because I'm really trying to decide the best agent upfront for him. Is it going to be amphotericin? Is it going to be POSA? Is it going to be isavuconazole? Is it going to be voriconazole? Of course, posaconazole and isavuconazole would be a little broader in terms of their spectrum. Voriconazole would be a little narrower because, you know, mucor would be missed out. Certain species of fusarium would be missed out. So every azole, you know, has a different spectrum. So that's why the neg combined negative predictive value would, would, would give me a very strong clue towards non-aspergillus molds in these patients. So in the last three months, we have had three such patients, you know, both blood PCR and galactomannan negative. So it looks like a non-aspergillus mold. And then biopsy tells us something else. You know, one has turned out to have mucor, one turned out to have a pigmented mold, one turned out to have a fusarium. And what is the turnaround time? I think, Dr. Ritu, we have run out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Parikshit. There are six questions lying for you in the question answer box. If you can type the answer, the yes, audience sir. will be happy. And we will move on with our second talk of the day and I'll share my screen. Uh, now we have a lecture by Dr. Amar Das Gupta and the topic is current approach to risk profiling of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, Dr. Amar Das Gupta is MD, PhD, fellow UICC, fellow ISHTM, is director of medical services, and consultant hematopathologist at Suburban Diagnostics, Mumbai. So, Amar, over to you. Thank you, Mohan. Uh, as always, great to be a part of the uh, you know, Mumbai Hematology Group activity, with which uh, I personally has been associated with four decades since I came to Mumbai. So, it's always very dear to me. Uh, as uh, Mohan, you have shared, uh, I'm going to talk on uh, risk profiling in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, uh, a topic which uh, uh, would be of great interest to all the hemato-oncologists. Uh, I'm not sure if too many of them are in attendance today, uh, but I thought uh, while selecting the topic, I should talk on something uh, which uh, clearly shows the uh, importance or role of uh, laboratory hematology in the management of hematolymphoid malignancies. And I thought of this as the appropriate topic to cover today. <clears throat> I've uh, decided to cover the following points uh, during my talk. Uh, the background of this uh, presentation, the clinical risk factors in ALL, genetic risk, risk factors in ALL, the role of MRD in risk profiling in ALL, and finally, immunophenotypic correlates of risk in ALL. Because uh, at this uh, time when uh, flow cytometry is uh, very <coughs> widely used in diagnosis of hematolymphoid malignancies, uh, certain phenotypes which uh, have emerged in recent times with the help of, uh, uh, help of the use of a large panel of uh, monoclonal antibodies in the diagnostic uh, reagent armamentarium. Uh, some of these uh, phenotypes point towards uh, uh, the, uh, towards certain uh, genetic and uh, molecular abnormalities, which in in turn are related to the prognosis in these cases. So, just by looking at the immunophenotype of uh, blast cells in the case of uh, acute leukemias. Uh, and in this case, ALL, one can also uh, surmise as to the possible molecular lesion in a given case. And therefore, uh, although one does go ahead and do the remaining part of the diagnostic, uh, uh, you know, uh, armamentarium that we have, uh, our workup, uh, it helps us get, get some insights into our preliminary idea 
into the possible risk factors that the given patient would have. <clears throat> now, uh, the next two slides just uh, builds up the, uh, you know, the theme. And as we all know, acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a heterogeneous disease at the demographic and clinical, as well as genetic levels. Although ALL can occur at any age, it is more prevalent among children, particularly those in the age group of three to six years. And these are all well-known facts, I think, knew about them. Males have a higher incidence of ALL than females, with a male to female ratio of 1.4 to 1, which uh, increases in uh, favor of males in certain published data. Uh, children treated by modern protocols have remission rates of over 90% and overall survival of 80%. In contrast, in adult ALL, remission rate is 6 to 80% and the survival rate of less than 50%. These figures also tend to vary a little, but I have uh, got these from a recent publication, so I suppose this should be okay. <clears throat> Survival, as indicated by the earlier statement, uh, decreases with increasing age. And that, of course, is shown by the changing or declining survival rates as the age of the patient increases. Uh, for a long time, traditionally, we are aware of the various uh, risk factors that we see in patients um, as they present to the um, clinician. And uh, some of these um, are well known now. Say, for example, association of male sex, older patients, as I was just mentioning, those with high white cell count, more than 50,000, uh, CNS involvement and T cell LL have traditionally been found to be associated with greater risk of relapse and death in ALL patients. And that, of course, reflects the aggressive nature of the biological behavior of the disease, which in turn is the culmination of adverse effects of one or more genetic lesions in the neoplastic population, which then influences the therapy in a negative way. And this is uh, the concept which I'm going to dwell on as we go ahead. <clears throat> and this realization that um, ALL is a heterogeneous disorder, even within the immunophenotypic subtypes, say for example, BALL, it is heterogeneous. Uh, has led to uh, the need for a search for the presence of risk factors up front at the time of presentation of the patient through a process of what we call now as risk profiling or risk stratification uh, and then offer to the patient a treatment regime uh, that is that takes care of the associated higher risk of uh, uh, poor response or uh, lower survival or rela early relapse. So this is the objective of risk stratification or risk profiling. Now, starting with the genetic risk factors, uh, a comprehensive genetic testing of patients suspected of ALL uh, is able to diagnose uh, and identify important prognostic and predictive biomarkers which can be used to tailor the therapy, something which I just now mentioned in my previous slide. <clears throat> Primary genetic abnormalities, and these are, uh, uh, what should I say, general statements with respect to gen genetic testing uh, approach. Primary genetic abnormalities are more reliable prognostic markers than secondary ones, probably due to the fact that the primary genetic abnormalities define the key features of the clone and are ubiquitous. Therefore, the focus of most screening algorithms in ALL is on the reliable detection of key primary chromosomal or genetic abnormalities used to stratify patients into different risk groups. And we'll see this uh, shortly. What are the methods that we follow for evaluation of genetic risk uh, profiling? Uh, the Common ones are the cytogenetics, uh, complemented or in addition to uh, uh, that, we use fluorescence in situ hybridization. And of course, reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction or RT PCR. Uh, there are now uh, more complex and uh, advanced technologies which are uh, looking at the 
molecular uh, lesions in a more uh, specific and more detailed manner. And these are, uh, some of the examples are multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification or MLPA, DNA copy number arrays, and targeted gene resequencing. Uh, these are being increasingly used nowadays to screen the new and emerging genetic markers. Now coming to the various favorable prognostic markers in ALL, uh, especially in uh, BLL, uh, there are two of them which uh, catch the eyes and, and that is because these are uh, shown or have been she seen to be uh, more important than um, less ones or minor ones or secondary ones which uh, one comes across. Now these are ETV6 runs one, uh, a genetic biomarker, which is a product which results from translocation 1221 uh, P13Q22, which is a lesion which, you, although a cytogenetic lesion and the uh, gene product is ETV runs one, uh, this cytogenetic abnormality or genetic abnormality cannot be picked up by traditional cytogenetic methods, and therefore, FISH or RT PCR is required for accurate detection. And the second uh, commonly encountered, uh, particularly in the pediatric age group, favorable uh, genetic marker is <clears throat> high hyperdiploidy. That is uh, increased number of chromosomes, which are beyond way beyond 46. And that's why it's called high hyperdiploidy. Uh, here, we see around 51 to 65 chromosomes in these cases, and it is readily detectable by cytogenetics and therefore easy to access. Uh, and also uh, it is easy because uh, you can do it by locus specific or centromeric fish probes as the pattern is going to involve mainly uh, you know, eight chromosomes, which are the chromosome X, 4, 6, 10, 14, 17, 18, and 21. And once we know that these are the chromosomes which are likely to be uh, duplicated or uh, triplicated in the process of high hyperdiploidy production, you can use uh, specific uh, probes uh, to target these uh, suspected uh, chromosomes and pick them up uh, without much difficulty uh, with the help of uh, fish or even simple cytogenetics. And as I mentioned, this is uh, seen particularly uh, more commonly in the pediatric age group, but uh, um, seen in about 20 to 30% of B precursor ALL cases in general. And uh, as I'll show you later, I don't think I should spend too much time on this slide. Uh, what it says is that uh, they account for these two just now that I mentioned, they account for approximately 60% of pediatric and adolescent ALL, but less than 15% of adult ALL, <clears throat> with uh, ETV6 runs one being virtually non-existent among adults beyond 30 years of age. Patients uh, with either of these abnormalities have a very good outcome compared to those uh, which are age matched, but don't have these abnormalities. And the overall survival of these patients uh, beyond uh, five years is over 90% in pediatric ALL and over 55% in adult ALL. In contrast to the favorable risk factors, the high risk genetic markers are six as listed here. And uh, these are now well known, KMT2A, uh, which is associated with MLL gene translocations, uh, then translocation 922 or BCR-ABL, translocation 1719, uh, and IAMP21 or interification of chromosome 21. And then again, in uh, opposite of hyperdeployed uh, chromosomes, you see poor prognosis in patients with haploid or low hypodeployed uh, chromosome numbers. <clears throat> and this uh, figure shows very beautifully the two sets of uh, 
patients. Uh, the one on the left are the children and ad adolescents. The one on the right are the adults. And the two bars represent the relative incidence of the various favorable and high risk factors in these two uh, broader groups. And as you can see here, uh, around 10% of, or maybe a little more, of patients with uh, children with uh, ALL have these six high risk factors, while the remaining 80% and above have either intermediate or good risk factors. And in fact, 50% almost of pediatric ALL patients will have uh, high hyperdiploidy or ETV6 runs one, which I just now mentioned are markers of better prognosis. In contrast, you can see the distribution of high risk and good risk or favorable risk and intermediate risk uh, genetic abnormalities are equally distributed in terms of incidence. And therefore, uh, the uh, outcome to uh, conventional chemotherapy in the patients in the higher age group, as I mentioned earlier, is less favorable because of the preponderance or high incidence of these unfavorable uh, risk factors. I just uh, wanted to show you this, and this is something which uh, we used to do uh, decades back, and now again, a lot of interest is being shown in this uh, particular type of study, which is DNA and cell cycle analysis in patients of uh, leukemia and lymphoma. And this is a study which we published in which there was one patient, a pediatric uh, patient who had what we call as near haploid uh, DNA content. In other words, the chromosome numbers were near haploid. And as you can see here, in contrast to in the uh, B uh, scatter, uh, rather uh, histogram, you can see a small peak around uh, mark 50, which is representative of the, B, uh, of the lymphocytes, which is where normally the DNA content would be reflected in the um, you know, DNA cell cycle study. In contrast to that, you can see the patient's uh, blast cells have a DNA content which is almost half of uh, 50, which is around 25 or 30. So this is what uh, one sees. And using now flow cytometry being so common, one can use these technologies in addition to cytogenetics uh, to uh, confirm or even make a primary diagnosis of risk factors when it comes to uh, the ploidy analysis. And I just thought I will share this with you. And of course, you can see Mon is a co-author in this. And we used to work at that time uh, at Hinduja. Um, and he, we had the privilege of testing some of his patients. Uh, and this is one, of such, one such case. And as expected, the adults uh, on the right side uh, diagram figure have much worse uh, overall survival, as you can see. And the incidence or the survival declines uh, proportionately to the degree of uh, unfavorable uh, nature of the risk factor these patients have. In contrast to that, as you can see in uh, figure A, uh, the graphs are all beyond what you see in the adults. Uh, and even in the high risk group, the even free survival, because that is what is measured here in this case, uh, are not so bad as compared to the adult overall survival seen here. So this is just to prove the point that I have been trying to uh, emphasize that genetic risk factors have a tremendous role to play in terms of determining the overall outcome of patients of ALL, uh, particularly BALL, um, on conventional chemotherapy. Uh, TLL, we all know traditionally uh, had uh, been associated or was recognized to be associated with uh, poor prognosis, particularly because of the, uh, as I mentioned, uh, higher age, female sex, presence of medicinal mass, of course, and very high uh, white cell count. And in, in addition, as we have shown and published, uh, some of the uh, uh, proliferative markers, markers which indicate higher proliferative nature of uh, neoplastic cells tend to get expressed or uh, you know, manifested in the TLLs more than BLLs. And that may be one of the reasons uh, why the 
uh, why in the initial phases of chemo uh, or is, uh, earlier era of chemotherapy, the patients of TLL did worse than uh, patients of BLL. Uh, things have changed over time and um, of course uh, it's not the case anymore, but even within TLL nowadays with uh, the, again, uh, help of uh, flow cytometric immunophenotyping, we have come across an entity which we call as ETP ALL, uh, early T precursor ALL, which has a unique uh, immunophenotype in that it lacks some of the T markers and expresses uh, myelo some myeloid and stem cell markers, meaning thereby that these cells are derived from a stage in the ontogeny of uh, hemopoietic cell development where the uh, T cells uh, share uh, uh, some properties of the myeloid uh, lineage. In other words, it is now believed that T lineage is derived from the same uh, stem cell, myeloid stem cell, or myeloid T stem cell, which gives rise to the myeloid and the T lineages. And this is proven by the fact that ETPLL patients, I think I'll skip this, uh, show a gene expression profile, which is similar to that of hemopoietic stem cell. And as we recall, and if we recall that as we go backward in the ontogeny in hemopoiesis, the least uh, um, you know, committed and mature uh, precursor cell, cells tend to express uh, multiple lineage markers and they are yet not committed to one or the other lineage. And as they get committed to one or the other lineage, they then uh, confine their antigenic uh, profile to that lineage and lose the markers uh, which are not associated with that particular lineage. But in, as I said, in the earlier stages of uh, maturation, these cells have a multi-lineage kind of phenotype. And that is where I suppose the ETPLL um, blasts are derived from. And uh, uh, therefore this is uh, 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 a unique type of acute leukemia and carries uh, worse prognosis, but I, I'm sure with the passage of time, We'll have chemotherapeutic agents which will address this issue as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the coming to the next one, I don't have much time left. I think around five minutes or so. I just wanted to touch upon MRD, which has emerged as uh, a very important uh, prognostic marker. Uh, although MRD is not done at the time of presentation, unlike the earlier two <clears throat> approaches that I spoke about, but MRD is important along the uh, uh, management of the patient during the various stages of management of patient, because it's shown to be very beautifully correlated uh, with the overall outcome in patients of uh, ALL, uh, and not only ALL in other disorders also. Now, what is MRD? MRD is, uh, in other words, uh, measurable residual disease. And as we know, uh, when a patient gets into remission after chemotherapy, uh, about four weeks or so, uh, they still have a large number of residual cells in the bone marrow. Although morphologically, one will see uh, that the blast per percentage is less than 5%. And that is a ref definition of morphological remission. But even at that stage, 10 to the power nine leukemic cells are there in the body. And this is what uh, was known maybe three decades back. Uh, and that is even uh, true even today. <clears throat> so what do we do in measurable residual disease monitoring? We do tracking of the leukemic clone in a serial sample throughout the uh, treatment phase of the patient, either by PCR or by flow cytometry, looking at specific immunoglobulin or T cell receptor rearrangements, which are unique to a given case, or immunophenotypic aberrances in the uh, leukemic cells, which are different from the normal hemopoietic cells in the bone marrow at that stage of chemotherapy. And as we'll realize, patients who are being treated uh, with chemotherapy after four weeks, uh, in ALL patients, 
the marrow starts regenerating. And we have a large number of what we call as hematogons or B precursor cells. And the challenge in doing an MRD in these patients is uh, the challenge of distinguishing patients' uh, uh, hematogons from those of the residual leukemic cells because immunophenotypically they are very close to each other except for very subtle antigenic uh, changes or differences that one sees in the leukemic population compared to the uh, hematogons. And hematogons uh, tend to retain that profile uh, across the human population as well as in the same patient. So that works as a, a benchmark to compare uh, the profile of cells, other cells, and if there are residual leukemic cells, they would stand out from the pattern that we see in the flow cytomatic scatter plots. Uh, and one can locate them and count them and measure them. And an MRD of less than 0.01% is associated with better or favorable prognosis compared to cases where the MRD level is more than this. At the time of present, uh, at the time of remission, or along the way at different stages of management, and this is an example of uh, how the MRD can be picked up in a patient who has been treated for ALL. And as you can see here, the red dots represent the residual leukemic cells, and they stand out from the remaining uh, uh, dots or scatter plots because of the fact that they. Uh, and though that the blue and the purple and the green are actually the representatives of the hematogons. And as you can see, the leukemic cells are standing out or standing away from the uh, normal hematogons by virtue of the difference in the antigenic profile of uh, these cells. So that's all I like to say, but I certainly show you this uh, uh, figure which uh, was published by Children, Onco Children Oncology Group of the US in 2015. And it, it's a seminal uh, work which showed for the first time that when you use the cutoff of less than 0.01%, uh, you would be able to uh, stratify patients into different risk groups, depending on how many residual cells you are finding in the patient at the time of remission that is 29 days post chemotherapy. <clears throat> so I think I will skip this. Um, and finally, I would like to just quickly in two minutes, uh, try to show what I mentioned uh, earlier. And that is the use of immunophenotype of leukemic cells as a surrogate marker for the underlying molecular defects and the associated risk. And the next slide shows you the list of such immunophenotypic aberrancies that we see in um, ALL patients, wherein um, expression of myeloid antigens or loss of one or the other uh, B lymphoid antigens uh, is associated with uh, the various uh, genetic markers that we spoke about uh, just now, which indicate either poor or favorable prognosis. And as you can see here, even ploidy status does get correlated in uh, particularly the hyperdiploidy in patients of uh, ALL when one does immunophenotyping uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, since time is running out, I'll have to <clears throat> just show you this example of a, a case of BALL with uh, not a typical immunophenotype uh, and uh, suggesting that this is a case which would be associated with TTV6, lung immunophenotype, uh, sorry, genetic abnormality. And therefore, it, this shows a linkage between the uh, immunophenotype of uh, BALL patients with the genetic uh, marker of a favorable prognosis in this case. So the take home messages are that recent advances in molecular studies have made very significant contribution to our understanding of genetic heterogeneity of ALL. This in turn has provided an opportunity to separate the low risk patients from the high risk ones and has helped us in optimizing the therapy in accordance with the associated risk. And a very good example would be 
tailoring the therapy in a case of ALL or for that matter, other hematolymphoid malignancies based on the MRD status. Integration of flow cytomatic immunophenotyping, MRD assessment, and cytogenetic studies, including the molecular and genetic uh, analysis, yields excellent results in risk stratification of cases of ALL, by and large at presentation, but also along the way during the treatment. Thank you. So sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amar Das Gupta, for that lovely talk on profiling of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We are run out of time, so we will not have question and answer session. I request Dr. Sanjeev Gupta to type his question in the chat box, and Amar can directly answer that. We will move on to the next lecture, and for that, I will share my screen again. The next lecture is by Dr. Bhavin Shah, and this lecture is on acalabrutinib in previously untreated and relapsed refractory chronic lymphocytic leukemia supported by AstraZeneca. Uh, Dr. Bhavin Shah, as you know, is consultant medical oncologist, hematologist, is director hemato-oncology clinic at HOC Vedanta, Ahmedabad. Uh, thank you, and I stop sharing, request Bhavin to begin his talk. Sure. Uh, Uh, can you? Uh, not yet, Bhavin. Yeah. Can you see the slide, slide yes. now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so good evening. Uh, I'm thankful to Mumbai Hematology Group and uh, Dr. Ambi Agrawal for giving me this opportunity and AstraZeneca to providing the slides for this presentation. I'm going to talk on acalabrutinib in previously untreated and relapsed refractory chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We all know that the chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a disease of a elderly people and median age at the time of diagnosis is around 72 years. Approximately 89% of the patient have one or more comorbidities at the time of diagnosis. Many patients who are asymptomatic, they don't require treatment, but most of the patient at one point of time require treatment. And the, uh, they, because they have a lot of comorbidities, we have to select the treatment wisely. Now, because the many patients have associated comorbidities, the study was performed in around 1100 patient plus in patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia to evaluate the baseline comorbidities. And in the studies, what they found that around 40% of the patient had hypertension and approximately 27% had a cardiac condition at the time of diagnosis. These multiple comorbidities may impact the treatment outcome in patients with CLN. And so we have to select the treatment as per the comorbidities so that we can get a maximum efficacy with minimal toxicity. Chemoimmunotherapy was a standard of care before few years, but after that, the targeted treatment like BTK inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors came into the picture. And the, if you see the four years median follow-up in first line treatment in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, the various studies which use BTK inhibitors like Resonate 2 and Illuminate, which has used Ibrutinib, plus or minus uh, anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, or in Elevate TN, the Acalabrutinib was used as a monotherapy or along with Obinutuzumab. Whereas in CLL14, the BCL2 Vanitoclax inhibitors, Vanitoclax is used along with Obinutuzumab. And in all these studies, they are compared with chlorambucil-based chemoimmunotherapy. And we can see on these figures that 
Each of this targeted therapy has shown a significant improvement in progression-free survival compared to immunotherapy, chemoimmunotherapy. In this talk, we will talk specifically on acalabrutinib, and we all know that it is a highly selective, potent next-generation BTK inhibitors. So he, it has a highly uh, specific activity against BTK uh, enzymes, and it has a minimal of target activity and because of that the class specific effect of BTK inhibitors are less compared to ibrutinib. Now, which are the studies on this on the basis of which these drugs get approval. So, this is the Alivert TN, it is an open label phase 3 study of acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab versus obinutuzumab plus chlorambucil in patients with treatment new chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The around 500 plus patients were equally distributed between the three cohort. And the primary endpoint of the study was independent review committee assess progression-free survival between acalabrutinib plus obinutuzumab versus obinutuzumab chlorambucil. The secondary endpoint was IRC assess PFS between acalabrutinib monotherapy versus Obinutuzumab and chlorambucils, IRC assess overall response rate, overall survival, time to next treatment, and safety. As you see in all these three cohorts, the patients are equally distributed as per the age, sex, epoch, performance status, rise stages, as well as the high risk uh, cytogenetics and FISH studies. Now, the interim analysis was done at the end of 28.3 months. And it has shown that 99% statistically significant reduction in risk of disease progression of death with ACAL plus obinutuzumab versus obinutuzumab chlorambucin. If we see ACAL monotherapy, then also it shows 80% statistically significant reduction in risk of disease progression or death compared to obinutuzumab chlorambucin. So this study was. Uh, do done an extended follow up at four years and at, at the end of four year the progression free survival was significantly better with acal based treatment compared to chemoimmunotherapy and the if you see the risk reduction for disease progression and death is reduced by 90% with acal plus obinutuzumab and 81% with acalabrutinib monotherapy now if you see in patients with high risk uh, genetic mutation like TP53 mutation and 17P deletion. The patients without mutations, they have a significant uh, better progression-free survival with ACAL. And even in patients with mutations, we can see that the patient who have uh, treated with uh, ACAL-based treatment have a better progression-free survival. Same way, in patient with IGHV mutation, the acalabrutinib has shown a better progression-free survival uh, in patients with mutated IGHV. But even in patients who have unmuted IGHV, they also shown a better progression-free survival compared to chemoimmunotherapy. Now, on the forex plot, if we see the according to the age, sex, rise, stage, epoch performance status, or the bulky disease, the Acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab is, is shows favorable result compared to chemoimmunotherapy. And same way with the high risk cytogenetics like deletion 17 or TP53 mutation or 11 uh, mutation, deletion 11 or IGHV mutation status, complex cytogenetics, which all of this favors the ACAL based uh, treatment uh, in compared to chemoimmunotherapy. Now, if we see the safety and tolerability of uh, uh, patients who are treated with acal based treatment, the class-specific side effects like diarrhea, headache, upper respiratory tract infection, nasopharyngitis, they are seen more in patients who are treated with acalabrutinib-based treatment. The grade 3 adverse events was 77% with acal plus obinutuzumab versus 58% with ACAL monotherapy and 71% with obinutuzumab chlorambucil. The death due to adverse event was six in six patients with ACAL plus obinutuzumab, 
13 patients with acalabrutinib and 13 patients with ubinutuzumab to rambucil based treatment. Now, the class specific side effect like atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmias, and hypertension, which seen more in patients with uh, acal based treatment, but usually they are less than 5 to 7 percent, and even in grade 3 or more, is almost atrial fibrillation is less than 1 percent, the hypertension is less than 3 percent, and no cases of ventricular tachy arrhythmias was seen in acal brutinib arm. The 0.6% is because of the ventricular asystole. Same way treatment discontinuation is slightly less in acal based treatment and dose reduction because of adverse event is significantly less in patients who are treated with acalabrutinib compared to obinutuzumab to rambucin. Now the question is that the patient who had reached, achieved the CR or CRI with a calabrutinib can, had achieved the undetected MRD. So in this case, CR and in this study, the CR and CRI was uh, evaluated with the help of bone marrow, but the MRD study was done with the peripheral blood only. And out of the patient, out of patient who have achieved CR or CRI, the 38 percent of the patients with obinutuzumab and a calabrutinib had achieved undetected MRD compared to 9% with uh, ovinotuzumab to rambucil and 10% with uh, acalabrutinib monotherapy. So the patient with acalabrutinib, almost more than one third of the patient had who has achieved CR or CRI had found the undetected MRD. Unfortunately, this is a continuous treatment, indefinite treatment, and the clinical relevance of measuring MRD in with continuous therapy is not yet been assessed. Now, the other important study of a calabrutinib was the ASEN study. The ASEN was the first and only BTAK inhibitors monotherapy to demonstrate superior progression-free survival in relapsed refractory chronic lymphocytic leukemia in phase three trial versus targeted agent combination like idilalisib plus rituximab or chemoimmunotherapy, that is bendamustin rituximab. The, uh, the, at the follow-up of 22 months, the median progression-free survival was not reached with ACAL-based treatment versus 16.8 months with idilarisib rituximab or BR protocol. And here we can see that ACAL-abrutinib-based treatment at the end of 20 month, 22 months shows better progression-free survival. The risk reduction of disease progression or death is reduced by 73% in patients who are treated with acal monotherapy compared to rituximab based idilalisib plus uh, rituximab or bendamustine plus rituximab treatment. Now, the another important study is Elevate RR. It is an First non-inferiority open-label phase three study of acalabrutinib versus ibrutinib in previously treated patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Here also in this study, 500 plus patients were randomized equally in acalabrutinib and ibrutinib arm. The primary endpoint of this study was to prove non-inferiority on investigator uh, independent review committee assessed progression-free survival. And the secondary endpoint was to see the incidence of any grade atrial fibrillation or flutter, incidence of grade three or more infection, incidence of retard transformation and overall survival. The patients are distributed equally as per the age, male, epoch performance status, bulky disease, rise stage, number of prior uh, treatment for CLL and the high risk cytogenetics and IGH mutation. And here we can see that the progression-free survival at the end of 40.9 month is equal in both the arm. And so the primary endpoint of this study was met that the ACAL is not inferior to ibrutinib in patients with relapsed refractory chronic lymphocytic leukemia. If you see the incidence of atrial flutter and fibrillation, 
which was 9.4% with ACALB based treatment and 16% with ibrutinib. So it suggests that there is a 41% reduction, relative reduction in incidence of any grade AF and atrial fibrillation. Now, leading to discontinuation of treatment because of the AF was zero in ACAL based treatment compared to 16.7% in ibrutinib arm. The secondary, the other secondary endpoints were the grade three or more infection, return transformation, and overall survival. And we can see the grade three or more infection was equal in both the arm. Return transformation incidence was also almost similar in the, both the arm. And independent review committee assess overall survival at the end of 40.9 months was similar in the both uh, arm with ACAL or ibrutinib. Now, the common side effects and safety uh, with ACAL ibrutinib, which is headache, is more common with ACAL ibrutinib compared to ibrutinib. The URTI is equal in both the group and the atrial fibrillation, hypertension and hemorrhage are less with ACAL based treatment compared to ibrutinib. So fewer patients discontinue in ACAL arm compared to ibrutinib. So 14.7% with ACAL ibrutinib versus 21.3% in patients with ibrutinib. If you see the incidence of hemorrhage was the mild average was 50% in ibrutinib versus 38%, but the grade three or more hemorrhage is less than 5%. The ventricular arrhythmia is almost nil with acalabrutinib, and hypertension was also significantly low with acalabrutinib compared to ibrutinib. And so it is a safer drug compared to ibrutinib in patients with high risk cardiovascular uh, disease. Same way, the atrial flutter, fibrillation, hypertension, and hemorrhage, we can see it is quite less in a calabrutinib arm compared to ibrutinib arm. Now, why we should have a concern about the low-grade atrial fibrillation? So atrial fibrillation of any grade increase the risk of serious cardiovascular event, including the stroke. The meta-analysis comparing the asymptomatic, that is the grade one, or symptomatic grade two or more atrial fibrillation found no difference in all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and stroke between these groups. So stroke prevention is considered for patients with atrial fibrillation, regardless of grade or presence of symptoms. So all these patients required anticoagulant and one of the side effects of uh, BTK inhibitors are hemorrhage. And so we have to remain very vigilant when we use uh, anticoagulant in patients who have atrial fibrillations, uh, when we use at anticoagulant because the chances of hemorrhages are little higher. In elevate RR study, any great atrial fibrillation lead to discontinuation uh, was 16.7% with ibrutinib and 0% with acalabrutinib. The another important question is, how does the rate of atrial fibrillation with acalabrutinib in Elevate RR compared with those who observed in Elevate TN and SN was on the higher side? So if we see the incidence of atrial fibrillation in Elevate RR was around 9.4% with acalabrutinib. Whereas in Elevate TN, it was less than 5% with uh, ACAL plus obinutuzumab or 6% in ACAL monotherapy. And in SN trial, it was around 5.8%. Uh, on further uh, evaluation, it was found that the in Elevate RR, patients on ACAL ibrutinib had higher rate of prior atrial fibrillation than ibrutinib. But de novo atrial fibrillation was only in 6% of the patient. Of the patients who had any grade atrial fibrillation on ACAL containing uh, protocol was 40% had a prior atrial fibrillation versus 12% with ibrutinib arm. And when we exclude the patients with prior atrial fibrillation, 6% of the patient experienced new onset atrial fibrillation on ACAL arm versus 15% on ibrutinib arm. Now, 
we are going to discuss some about something about the pooled analysis of cardiovascular events with ecalabrutinib so in this pool analysis uh, from four phase 1 to 3 studies treated with one or more dose of ecalabrutinib uh, were evaluated there were around 762 patients and it was found that any grade atrial fibrillation and flutter with ecalabrutinib was 5% with median duration of exposure of around 24.9 months now if you see in all this uh, cohort the grade three or more toxicity is almost 1% or less the rate of cardiac adverse event onset was generally consistent and usually it occurs within the first 6 month of ecalabrutinib and after that the newer incidents are quite less among 38% with atrial fibrillation and flutter the 18% had a history of arrhythmia and atrial fibrillation prior to starting the treatment among 67 patients with hypertension around 69% had a pre existing hypertension and around 27% had a risk factor for hypertension now this is another very important study the cl208 that was a phase 2 open label study of ecalabrutinib in ibrutinib intolerant patients with relapsed refractory clf so in a patient who are ibrutinib intolerant when we cannot use it further patient was shifted to ecalabrutinib so among 42 patients were discontinued ibrutinib due to commonly reported adverse event and out of that 62% patients who were treated with ecalabrutinib did not experience any recurrence of adverse event with ecalabrutinib and at the end of 2 years follow up 48 was patient that is 80% was still on the study only 7 patient that is 12% discontinued ecalabrutinib due to adverse event now if the patients develop uh, adverse event which is more than 3 3 or more than 3 grade then what are the uh, guidelines for dosage recommendation a dosage modification so any patients with grade 3 thrombocytopenia with bleeding or grade 4 thrombocytopenia patients with grade 4 neutropenia lasting longer than 7 days and grade 3 or greater non hematological toxicity the dose modification is required if the patient have first and second occurrence of the toxicity we have to interrupt the dose once the toxicity has resolved to grade 1 or baseline we have to start the ecalabrutinib at the same 100 mg every 12 hourly if the patient develops the third uh, time uh, grade 3 or more toxicity we have to interrupt the ecalabrutinib once the toxicity has resolved to grade 1 or baseline we have to reduce the dose to 100 mg once a daily and if this patient develop the toxicity once again fourth time then we have to permanently discontinue the ecalabrutinib now what should we do to characterize the ecalabrutinib associated headache the headache is most common adverse event or very specific side effect uh, with ecalabrutinib and in the pooled analysis of 1040 patients with hematological malignancy treated with ecalabrutinib monotherapy headache usually occurred in first 6 month of treatment and resolved with no recurrence 97% of the time the headache were of grade 1 or grade 2 the median duration of uh, starting headache was around 20 days and only one patient required discontinuation of ecalabrutinib due to headache now this headache usually respond very well to acetaminophen and caffeine supplement now if the patient develops atrial fibrillation what should be what should be the consider with ecalabrutinib a patient with antithrombotic treatment in clinical trials the major hemorrhage occurred in 3.6% of the patient taking ecalabrutinib with anticoagulant agents compared to 2.7% in those without any anticoagulants so patient who receiving antithrombotic anticoagulant agents 
have increased risk of hemorrhage and because and due to that we have to monitor the patients very closely and for any signs of bleeding with con uh, with concomitant use of acalabrutinib and anticoagulant the warfarin and vitamin k antagonist should not be administered concomitantly with acalabrutinib and so the anticoagulant of choice should be a doag and considering the risk benefit risk of withholding the acalabrutinib so any patient undergoing surgery uh, with minor surgery we have to stop the acalabrutinib 3 days prior and 3 days post surgery to reduce the risk of bleeding thank you very much for the patience here thank you dear that was wonderful review of uh, acalabrutinib in both our front and relapsed setting so any questions from the faculty present here just check if there is anything in the question no there is no nothing in the question answer box so okay uh, having thank you very much for that wonderful talk and we will move on probably with the last lecture of the day so this session is uh, from uh, lilac insights private limited first we have a paper presentation by karishma todi scientific officer at lilac the co authors of this paper are uh, ankit prabhu desai rohit wagode pritha roy and pratibha amre kadam uh, the title of the paper is str chimerism a reliable method for post engraftment monitoring in sex and non sex mismatched allo hsct cases uh, after this paper is presented we have a panel discussion which will be moderated by dr sarmila chandra she is consultant hematologist park clinic kolkata and the panelists for that panel discussion include dr ritu jain from mumbai dr gaurav dikshit from new delhi dr samir tulpole and dr virendra patel from mumbai so we come to the case presentation by karishma So am I audible? Yes. Uh, is my slides available? Uh, visible? Visible. Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. So today my topic for the discussion will be about the STR chimerism. How it is a reliable method for post engraftment monitoring in the BMT cases. a uh, bone marrow transplant is a procedure where a healthy donor cells are being transplanted into the patient to replace their deceased cells next there are different types of bone marrow transplant it is like autologous allogeneic umbilical cord blood transplant but today i'm going to mainly focus upon what is the allogeneic bone marrow transplant and how the post engraftment is the monitoring is very important for us to take any further future calls uh in uh, bone marrow transplant cases what happens is that the healthy donor stem cells are being selected genetically profile matching is being done with the patient and then it is being transplanted into the recipient cells after few months like after few days like day 14 or day 20 the post engraftment monitoring is being done now this post monitoring and engraftment is called as a chimerism testing in which we uh, uh, look out for whether there is a complete chimerism that is only the donor cells are present in the recipient or any mixed chimerism has occurred which leads to the recipient and donor cells to occur there are different methodologies through which we can go about testing the chimerism uh, like they are divided in two parts either quantitative or qualitative but if we look out with the qualitative we can get a rough estimation about what is a how much chimerism percentage is present or whether there is a absence or a presence of a donor cells but if we see the look out for quantitative methods a particular amount like a particular percentage has been given out through which we can it is very easy to calculate how much percentage of a donor cells are present and how much percentage of recipient cells are present but as we all know the vntr is the first genetical marker study uh which is approved by national bodies for doing the chimerism testing so today i'm going to focus about a topic where we have done few 
case studies in which the uh, str were results were uh, more reliable compared to the vntr but before that i want to give a small difference between the what is a vntr and what is an str as we all know the vntr is a qualitative assay and str is quantitative assay now to give a brief description is that the when we do a vntr we take a, at least four to five markers are there where different master mixes are prepared followed by the gel electrophoresis now as you can see over here the gel electrophoresis the bands are visible but in the lane two there are two bands available for one patient but we cannot determine what is the difference between the two alleles that is how much base pair difference is there how much area difference is there how much height difference is there and how much base pair difference is there so which is something is lacking in the gel electrophoresis but at the same time when we check for the short tandem repeat in this technique there is only a single master mix is there where 16 different fluorescently tagged primers are added uh, which have a, a different a chromosomal location and uh, due to which after followed by that the capillary electrophoresis is being done now once the capillary electrophoresis is done the signals are emitted by the fluorescent primers which is captured by our particular software now that software results into a particular output that is the base pairs which we can see over here what is the height over here what is the area and what are the allele numbers so it becomes very easy for us to discriminate between the two alleles and this information helps us to rely difference between the dod donor alleles and the recipient allele which helps us for the post engraftment studies now to justify these two differences we have done few case studies which i am going to discuss it further but before that i want to explain what is the basic str chimerism now strs these are the small dna markers which are repeated in a tandem pattern in every individual so once a different uh, uh, alleles are determined between the donor cells and between the recipient cells it's very easy for us to do the post engraftment studies after the determining the different types of alleles for example if i take this d3 marker there are several set of alleles present ranging from 12 to 15 so it is possible that a donor can express either a allele 20 or uh, 12 and 13 or uh, any particular allele and donor can express a different allele and these signals are then auto generated and we get a software generated values that is allele number the height the area which where we become uh, visible that yes these are the informative markers where we can further analyze for our post engraftment studies so after the post bmt is done when again we receive the samples initially the there are two categories which we decide whether the alleles which is present between the recipient and donor they are the homozygote allele or whether they are the heterozygote allele and if there are uh, there are heterozygote allele so is there any sharing of the alleles between the donor and recipient so a dilemma is definitely included in here but still the str has a formula where we can calculate how much percentage of chimerism is present for example this is the category 3 where the uh, donor is a uh, heterozygous and uh, the recipient is a homozygous and when the post marrow transplant which we observe we get a automated generated area values using this particular formula we can definitely calculate the percentage chimerism but these things are not at all possible by using a vntr analysis technology now to justify these things we have done a few case studies out of which i'm going to present upon the first case study that is a of a 30 year old male who was diagnosed with all and it had a two pathogenic mutations in etv6 and ranx1 the patient underwent a same sex uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant when we did pre bmt analysis by vntr only two markers were informative that is d1sat and idgh as you can see the recipient it has only two bands and donor has one band hence this is informative in recipient it has a single band and in donor it has a two bands so definitely it is an informative but pap uh, primer since the genetical profile is same so we cannot give any informativeness on the other hand the str it showed us 13 informative markers that is the there is a wide range of markers which is uh, which are informative but if we go into more depth it's like when we observe it particularly if we can see d7sat here we can exactly calculate my uh, there are two alleles present in the recipient that is allele 11 and 11 13 
and uh, in donor it is allele 8 and uh, allele 13 exactly we can give a calculated copy there is no human observation but in a vntr base we cannot give an exact calculation at how much base pair is my this allele and how much base pair is that allele which is something a lacking process in between the vntr and str when for the same patient when we did the post engraftment studies what did we find out that the VNTR and STR results were correlated? That is 100% chimerism was observed till the day 47. But from day 99 onwards, a mixed chimerism pattern was observed by both the techniques. That is VNTR also by STR also. But the difference arised was between the percentage of how much chimerism is present. Because by STR, we came to know that the patient had 52.5% chimerism, but only 75% chimerism was there with the VNTR. Now to justify that, why did it happen is that the, J, uh, the VNTR, it's based upon the gel density. As you can see over here, this is my pre-BMT specimen of the recipient. This is my donor specimen. And this is my post-BMT specimen. Definitely, the recipient cells are expressed in the post-BMT samples. The, the only difference lies upon these two bands. Now, since the intensity of this band is 75%, but we cannot conclude in this band how much contribution is done by my recipient cells or by my donor cells, which is very difficult to analyze. But at the same time, if I see my STR profile, it is clearly giving me that, yes, this is my donor Ali, this is my recipient and this is my donor and recipient sharing allele. So for by STR software generated, it's very easy to calculate my allele number, the area and height, and which is very easy to give an exact calculation, not a rough estimation. Now, when we did a case two study of a 52-year-old female who was diagnosed with pH positive ALL, underwent a, a bone marrow transplant, only one VNTR marker was informative, but whereas by STR, the 13 markers were very informative, again, STR became a more informative markers over here. When we did a post-BMT analysis on the 470 day, what we observed was that by VNTR, 100% donor cells were observed, means 100% chimerism. But on contradictory, the STR, it showed 42.7% donor cells. By FISH, it showed us the 52% donor cells. And the same patient showed the relapsed IS percentage value, that is 98% with the two TKD mutation. Now, again, the doubt comes over here. If these results are coinciding, coinciding, then why there is a contradictory result by the VNTR? The, the answer for this is that because as you can see over here in the lane two, the genes over here, that is the D1SAT markers. In the pre-BMT specimen only, the amplification is very faint due to some artifacts may be present, which has not led to its amplification. And when the post-BMT was done, definitely the recipient cells would be being present in this post-BMT specimen. But as the pre-BMT was so faint amplification, might be a chance that BMT sample must have failed to amplify such kind of uh, such kind of band amplification, which can lead us to false or negative result. And of another example, if I calculate my STR analysis, as you can see in the recipient pre-BMT, a single allele is present. In donor pre-BMT, two alleles are present. Now, when we got the post-BMT on our sample, this allele is being shared between the both. So now in this allele, how much contribution is of my recipient and how much is of my donor, that also we need to calculate for the final interpretation. And for that, we definitely we have one particular formula. Utilizing this formula, it is very easy for us to give yes, this much percentage of our donor cells are present and how much contribution is being done, which is very difficult to do on the gel test. So taking all these into consideration, I will conclude for the today is that my STR chimerism is definitely utilized in all donor and recipient combination, regardless it is of what gender, HLA or any disease types, then they are highly polymorphic, they are highly sensitive and they exhibit high informative rates in comparison to VNTR. Definitely these are the fluorescently tagged primers and we get a digitalized values. Now the national guidelines for hematopoietic stem cell by ICMR, they have told either to use VNTR or STR, but the Joint Accreditation Committee of International Society and European Society have recommended to use STR chimerism over the other methods. 
This is the dummy report which we gave it for the uh, post BMT analysis, where we provide the graph for the day of the uh, day 14 till the day we receive the samples, so that it becomes easy for the clinician to take a call upon the how many days of follow up, what is their post engraftment studies to be taken. And these are my references. And thank you. And any questions? Thank you, Karishma, for finishing in time and a wonderful presentation. Thank Besides you, the faculty present here, we have 200 audience who have logged in to listen to you. Uh, no questions in the question box. Any questions from the faculty here? Yes, Dr. Gaurav. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, um, one question uh, for Dr. Karishma. Like, how do we compare fish tamarism to uh, STR? One second. Okay, sir. Uh, so in how this... do we compare fish with the STR chimerism? And yes, uh, is there any benefit of doing fish over STR or, or vice versa in sex mismatched uh, bone marrow yes. transplant? Yes, definitely, sir. In the sex mismatched, as I have represented in the case two, uh, where we got like 42% cells were present in by the STR, but VNTR showed us the 100%. So when we did the fish analysis, we counted actually 1,000 cells to check because counting 100, 200, we can still skip. But uh, but we have taken efforts of doing 1,000 cells analysis. Depending upon that, we came to know that, yes, there is at least 50% of the cells were present in the by fish also. So definitely fish and STR has to be correlated in cases of the, uh, uh, the uh, sex mismatch chimerism or bone marrow transplant cases to occur. Is fish recommended in any of the guidelines or is it only STR? Uh, sir, in only STR is recommended over other method, but still they have told that fish should be done in the non-sex mismatch cases. But if like in the early stages, like on day 14 or day 20, when there are very minute cells, like in comparison to 99, only 1% cells are present, that is like 95% of the donor cells, it can be easily picked up by the STR, but definitely fish can pick where we have to calculate at least 1000 to 2000 cells. So that becomes very tremendous to do it. But definitely fish will pick it up. But until and unless we do 2000 cells analysis. So last question, sir. Uh, one, one thing is that uh, the fish is usually faster and results are uh, like uh, quicker. And you were saying that uh, you need to check for more number of cells. So how is it so that it is faster than as, as compared to STR? Uh, sir, it is actually the timing for both the technique is uh, utilized in the same way because if fish we are doing, we are doing culturing and after that followed by uh, putting up the probes and uh, overnight harvesting or even if you can say it, uh, four to five hours harvesting and observation. Exactly for the, when we take for the STR, it's a similar type where we have to do DNA extraction followed by PCR and then directly capillary electrophoresis. Dr. Gauro, can I interfere? I will yes, give you an answer. Yeah. I think fish is more, more faster and you don't require a culturing and fish is more sensitive in case of sex mismatch transplant. But at the same time, it correlates with the STR chimerism also. But definitely fish is more sensitive, but STR chimerism is more applicable in case of non-sex mismatch transplant, where fish, fish and other markers are not useful. That yeah. is the thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So now we go to the panel discussion, which will be moderated by Dr. Sarmila Chandra. Dr. Chandra, you have about 17 minutes for your panel discussion. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Can I have my presentation? Now we have a very uh, distinguished panel and we have three panelists. And first is Ritu Jain. Uh, she is from Bombay, and Dr. Gaurav Dikshit and Dr. Virendra Patil is from Hyderabad. So, uh, Dr. Dikshit is from Delhi, and we have representation from all over the country, and they are all BMT physicians. And I am a clinician, and I have been greatly uh, helped by this presentation by uh, Dr. Karishma. And thank you very much. It was very illuminative. And we know that this is the gold standard that we are seeing. And can I have my presentation?
Roshni, do you have her presentation with you? Yeah, she uh, has. No, sir. You don't know. Okay. Now I'm not getting share screen. See it now? Yes. Okay, so we have Dr. Ritu Jain, Dr. Virendra Patil, and Gaurav Dixit. They are all uh, hematologists, oncologists, and also BMT physicians. So we have a very distinguished panel, and we go on straight to the uh, presentation. Now, the first question that I will place uh, to my panelists, well, that's me, and I'm from Calcutta, and we have a BMT unit in our hospital, and we carry out transplantations, and we need this chimerism. Now, the first question, which is an undergraduate question, is practically, and what is a chimera? So I'm seeing a, uh, uh, Dr. Dixit first. Can, can you tell us about what is a chimera? It's a, can you see my presentation? Yes, ma'am, I can see your presentation. So Chimera uh, is a, as we can see uh, from the picture that this is a mythological uh, um, animal which has head of uh, loin and body of goat and tail is of uh, snake. So it represents the mixture of uh, three, four animals. Two genotypes practically. So uh, 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 a man with two genetic uh, components uh, is a man with a chimerism. And we see examples in nature quite often. We see a, a lady with two colored uh, irises. So one is probably blue and the other is brown. So that's a typical example of a chimerism. Now in bone marrow tra uh, transplantation, we have a completely different kind of chimerism. And that is because the, because uh, the donor cells are living in the body of a recipient and we have two types of cells possible and uh, this is a chimerism that we uh, do not want exactly, but still it happens. And we have had a good knowledge about the methodology. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but still uh, I want to ask the second question. And that is, is chimerism testing necessary after a stem shell transplantation? Who is next, please? Can you please answer this question? Maybe Ritu will take it up. Sure, ma'am. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Hello? You are audible. Yes, yes. yes ma'am. So, uh, like, I, yes, I would say the answer to your first question is documentation of chimerism necessary for alloacity. Uh, yes, it is because at the molecular level, we know that the cells are engrafted. The donor cells have, the recipient has engrafted the donor cells. And it is also important in non malignant conditions, also, we need, even if it's a mixed chimera, especially in thalassemia patients. So we are fine with that. Then, what are the time sequence for testing? So, we generally, ma'am, at the earliest, we do at day four plus 14, day 30. 
and uh, day 60, day 90 and day 120. These are the general uh, time sequences I follow and at day 180. But suppose if at day uh, 30 or day 60, I see there is a slipping chimerism, then I may do it on a monthly basis to monitor the uh, percentage of chimerism. Wonderful. That is exactly what we do. And now the next question that we have is, well, uh, I will go a little bit into the uh, methods of testing and we have heard about STR, and that is the gold standard. But what about other methods? Methodology, any, any uh, other methods available? There are some very simple methods which we used to do in the olden days. Uh, Ma'am, actually, if there is a blood group mismatch, uh, we do the blood grouping. And if there is a sex mismatch, I still do a fish testing for the patients who have a sex mismatch BMT or if there is a blood group mismatch. These are the two things which I can think of. Yeah, these are the olden day methods and it's not always possible. So we need a good method which can be uh, used across all uh, patient populations irrespective of sex, irrespective of their, back, their blood groups. And we need uh, initial uh, blood samples so that that can be followed up later on. And we have to do chimera testing. Okay. So we will now go on to, I've just mentioned three patients. And these are three patients that we did in the last uh, uh, one year, allo transplants that has uh, taken place in my hospital. And the first one is a 22 year old man from Jharkhand who presented in Calcutta to the OPD with a severe pancytopenia. And the hemoglobin uh, was very low. The a peripheral blood showed a severe pancytopenia and we did a bone marrow naturally and there was a severe hypoplasia and no, no dysplasia. Uh, congenital uh, pancytopenia was ruled out by uh, uh, the cytogenetic study and we decided quickly to do a bone marrow transplantation because this is something that is curative and this boy was in extreme danger coming from Jharkhand where not all sorts of uh, supportive care is available. So we decided to carry on the transplantation very, very fast. Now, what would you have done? So my other panelist, my third panelist, please. I can't see his face. Hello, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes uh, you are audible. Now yeah. I can see and you. Also, I would like Please to go ahead. What would you do? Yeah, so the slide has moved on. So this is a 20 year, 22 year old uh, young, uh, male uh, with uh, aplastic anemia and has uh, presented to you. Of course, the, the recommendation is to go ahead with uh, replacing the defective marrow. So uh, the recommendation, as per the recommendation, uh, uh, it stands like the patient need to be offered allogenic transplant, that is mass sibling donor if available. Um, so for now, probably the best method would be to do that allogenic mass sibling donor allogenic transplant. Yes. Now, this man, he presented with a, uh, uh, very quickly after diagnosis and we carried out the transplantation very fast. And unfortunately, he went through a lot of uh, uh, stormy course and had a lot of sepsis. Anyway, he uh, survived all that 
And on day 15, uh, we did the chimerism as Ritu told us, and the chimerism was 98%. On day 30, it was also 98%. And day 99, uh, it still showed a 99% chimerism and we could discharge the patient very fast to Jharkhand with a completely a re complete replacement of marrow, very happy and everything was uh, happy in this case. But unfortunately, the next case did not go so well. And this man presented in, a, in the same way with the pancytopenia and we diagnosed a case of bone marrow uh, aplasia. And we also decided to carry a matched sibling donor transplantation very fast in the course of the disease. And after the transplantation, day 15, well, uh, Dr. Uh, Dixit, Day, we did a day, day, 15, uh, day 15 chimerism. Will you do a day 15 chimerism in all cases? Do you think it's necessary? Ma'am, usually I don't do. I do uh, only in haploidentical transplants. Otherwise, uh, allogenic transplant, usually I do it on day 30. So day otherwise, 30. Uh, yes, ma'am. Day 30 trans uh, is the day I do. Actually, day 15... Day 15 chimerism has, hasn't got that much of a value, but we do it simply to document uh, engraftment. We feel that we feel very happy if it shows uh, donor cells, then we are happy that it is transplanted and everybody is you know, in a good mood. Anyway, day 15 was uh, 98%, but unfortunately on day 30, we put a lot of stress on the day 30 chimerism, it had dropped to 80%. So we were apprehensive. What we did at that time, we reduced the immunosuppression dose. We reduced the dose of immunosuppression and continued with the rest of the treatment. And on day 60, we repeated the chimerism and it had dropped further to 76 which is dangerous practically. And this is the time when we thought maybe we should, we should do a DLI and to uh, sort of uh, supplement the marrow, we carried out a DLI. And unfortunately, 15 days later, the counts crashed and the patient came out with a completely aplastic marrow and he had a graft rejection. And this was a, a very a sort of a very bad condition because these people cannot afford a second transplantation. Uh, it is extremely difficult to convince them for a second transplantation. Anyway, the money has run out and he went back to Jharkhand and uh, passed away soon after. So this is our second case that we had. Now, this is the third case that I'm, we did recently. Recently means it's about nine months now. It's a 42 years old lady from Kolkata who presented with a severe anemia to the OPD. And her CBC showed that she had a blast cells recognizable in the peripheral blood. The bone marrow showed acute myeloid leukemia and she went through a 3-7 induction. Now, after some time, after three months or so, she had a quick relapse. And at that time, we discovered that she had a matched sibling donor and we uh, sort of convinced her to have a bone marrow transplantation after a repeat induction therapy. And after preparing for the everything, we uh, gave a second induction chemotherapy and she fortunately went into remission and uh, here we uh, did not do a completely myeloablative transplantation. We decided to do a reduced intensity transplantation in view of her age and the two preceding chemotherapies which she has already had. 
Now, the day 15 chimerism, which we are doing regularly, showed that she, she had 98% uh, uh, donor cells in the bone, in the blood. But day 30 showed that the chimerism had dropped to 80%. What we did is reduce the immunosuppression a bit, but carried on in the same way. On day 60, the chimerism is 86%. After that, day nine, after that, we have followed up the chimerism and it's staying in the same level. And uh, uh, this patient is, this is a wrong statement. DLI was not carried out and she is in a good remission. Uh, it's about nine months now that she's still carrying out. So I've given you three patients, which we did in the last year. And I don't think time permits us to go on any further. And I will just finish off by saying uh, the take home message. Chimerism is a measurement of the graft engraftment and we have to follow it up through time uh, to see the progress of the graft and also to plan preemptive measures like immunotherapy or DLI, whatever is to be planned. We can plan according to the reports from the chimerism. I will end by saying this and thanking all my participants and Dr. Agarwal for calling me. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarmila Chandra and the panelists, Dr. Ritu Jain, uh, Dr. Gaurav Dixit, Dr. Virendra Patil, and thanks to Lilac Insights for supporting this. Uh, as we have really run out of the time, so we cannot have any further discussion. Thank you very much. And those of you who will be with us tomorrow at 6.30, you're most welcome. Day two of this uh, marathon, 45th Annual Conference of Mumbai Hematological. Thanks to one and all, and thanks to our audience were logged in 200 plus from almost 12 to 13 countries. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, sir.